there are many limitations with the way we assess brain health and mental health. As a psychiatrist, I noticed that a lot of times, my patients don't necessarily feel comfortable sharing with me their darkest feelings. And even if they do share, they may not be able to evaluate these feelings objectively. Moreover, they come to see me for 30 minutes once or twice a month, but they live with their symptoms 24 hours a day and seven days a week. Imagine that one day we can evaluate brain health not only continuously and objectively, but also outside of a doctor's office. With my background in both medicine and technology, I had an aha moment. When wearable technologies such as Fitbit and Apple Watch became popular, I asked myself, if there are fitness trackers for the human body, why can't we have fitness trackers for the human brain? But how are we going to build a brain fitness tracker? Again, my experiences outside of medicine gave me the second aha moment. As an amateur pianist, I'm always noticing that how well I play is linked to my concentration and my mood for that day. So one day as I was playing the piano, it occurred to me that we should, of course, look into the way we use the keyboard on our smartphones. To show you what I mean, recently I was evaluating someone with bipolar disorder, also known as manic depression. As this person was in a manic state, I was noticing how much faster they were speaking. Now, if I'm talking faster, I'm also going to be typing faster, right? Especially nowadays, we all text more than we make phone calls. So with this intuition, we put together a team of researchers and programmers, and we decided to make our own smartphone keyboard. And we put this keyboard on the App Store for everyone to use. This is how it works. After the keyboard is downloaded, you can set it to replace your standard iPhone keyboard. Every time you're texting someone, writing an email, or posting on social media, the timing of each key press is saved so that we can understand how fast or slow you're typing, the rhythm of your typing, as well as how often you use the backspace and the frequency of your typos. If you use this keyboard consistently, you would start seeing feedback information on the dashboard of our app, such as how many key presses you have entered for that day, just like you see how many steps you've taken for that day if you wear a fitness tracker. Today, I have entered more than 4,300 key presses so far, and more than 300 of them are backspaces. But how do we as researchers analyze all this data to give you an intuitive idea? We can, for example, quantify your typing performance by taking into account both the speed of your typing and the accuracy of your typing. But we can take it a step further by harnessing the power of artificial intelligence. Thanks to citizen science, we have recruited more than 2,000 participants and analyzed more than 30 million key presses as of today. In fact, we are now feeding all this typing information into algorithms and see how well we can predict brain health even when a person is not in a doctor's office. So what have we learned from our citizen scientists so far? I would like to highlight a few findings. In particular, I want to talk about 
how the way we type changes as we get older or when we feel depressed. But first, we have our best typing performance a few hours after we wake up in the morning. After our typing performance reaches its peak, it then fluctuates and gradually drops towards the end of the day. And this is the reason why we should think twice before writing that long work email at night. I don't do it myself anymore. How about age? How does age affect the way we type? We found that this fluctuation in typing performance is more magnified as we get older. We are now running a new study and see if we can use this fluctuation to better understand early signs of Alzheimer's disease. With regards to depression, our citizen scientists tend to make more typos and pause more when they experience higher degrees of depressive symptoms. Again, this is consistent with my observations in that my patients say to me all the time that when they are depressed, they can't stay focused and they can't maintain their concentration. So now that I've shared some of our findings that supported the feasibility of a brain fitness tracker, I want to emphasize that we still have a lot of work to do and there will be other ways of measuring brain health using technology. The future of technology should be about the well-being of all of us. We can all work together and use technology to improve the assessment, the diagnosis, and the treatment of brain disorders. Thank you very much.